exomoons is is kind of a niche topic within the discipline of exoplanets and that's largely because there are people I, I think are waiting for those slam dunks and it was like the if you go back to the first exoplanet discovery that was made in 1995 by Misha Mayor and Didier Kellos um I think it's true at the time that they were seen as mavericks, that the idea of looking for planets around stars was considered fringe science. And you know, I'm sure many colleagues told them, why don't you do something more safe, like study eclipsing stars, mm -hmm. two binary star systems, we know those exist, so why are you wasting your time looking for planets? You're gonna get this um, alien moniker or something, and you'll be, you'll be seen as a fringe maverick scientist. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was quite difficult for those early planet hunters to get legitimacy and be taken seriously. And so very few people risked their careers to do it, except for those that were either emboldened to try or had maybe the career, uh, maybe like tenure or something, so they didn't have to necessarily worry about the implications of failure. And so once that happened, once they made the first discoveries, overnight, you know, everyone and their dog was getting into exoplanets, and all of a sudden, the whole you know the whole astronomy community shifted, and huge numbers of people that were once upon a time studying eclipsing binaries, you know, changed to becoming exoplanet scientists. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first wave of exoplanet scientists. We're now in a kind of a second wave, or even a third wave, where people like me, to some degree, kind of grew up with the idea of exoplanets as being normal. You know, I was 11 years old, I guess, when the first exoplanet was discovered, and so to me, it was a fairly a uh, normal idea to grow up with. Um, and so we've been trained in exoplanets from the very beginning. And so that brings a different perspective to those who have maybe transitioned from a different career path. Um, and so I suspect with exomoons and probably techno signatures, uh, astrobiology, many of the topics which are seen at the, the fringes of what's possible, they will all open up into becoming mainstream one day, but every there's a lot of people who are just waiting, uh, waiting for that that assuredness that there is a secure career net ahead of them <laughs> before they commit. Yeah, it, it does seem to me that ExoMoons open wider or open for the first time the door to to aliens. So more seriously, academically studying. All right, let's let's look at like alien worlds. Like, mm. So um, I think it's still pretty fringe to talk about alien life, even on, like on Mars and the moons and so on. You're kind of like, you know, it would be nice. But imagine the first time you discover a living organism. That's going to change. Then then everybody will look like an idiot for not focusing everything on <laughs> this because yeah. the the possibility of the things will. It, it's possible it might it might be super boring. It might be very boring bacteria, but even the existence of life elsewhere. Yeah. Some, I mean, that changes everything. That means life is everywhere. Yeah. If you knew now that in five years, 10 years, the first life would be discovered elsewhere, you knew that in advance, it would surely affect the way you approach your entire career. As a, yeah. especially someone junior in astronomy, you would surely be like, well, this is clearly going to be the direction I have to dedicate my classes and my training and my education towards that direction. All the new textbooks, all the <laughs> yeah, stuff right. written. I mean, <clears throat> uh, and I, I think there's a lot of value to hedging, like allocating some of the time to that possibility because mm -hmm. the, the kind of discovery will, the kind of discoveries we might get in the next few decades um, it feels what, like we're on the verge of a lot of um, uh, getting a lot of really good data and having better and better tools that can process that data. So there's just going to be a continuous increase of the kind of discoveries that will open. Like, but a slam dunk, that's hard to come by. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of us are anticipating. I mean, we're already seeing it to some degree with Venus and the phosphine incident, um, but we've seen it before with Bill Clinton and the White House lawn announcing life from Mars and there, there are inevitably gonna be spurious claims or at least claims which are um, ambiguous to some degree. There will be for sure a high profile journal like Nature or Science that will one day publish a paper saying by a signature discovered or something like that on Trappist One or some other planet. And then there will be years of back and forth in the, in the literature. And that might seem frustrating, but that's how science works. It's in it. That's the mechanism of science at play of people scrutinizing the results to intense skepticism, and it's like a crucible. You know, you burn away all irrelevances until whatever is left is the truth, and so you're left with this this product 
which is that, okay, we either believe or don't believe that biosignatures are there. So there's inevitably going to be a lot of controversy and debate and argument about it. We just have to anticipate that. And so I think you have to basically have a thick skin to some degree academically to dive into that world. And you're seeing that with um, with phosphine. It's been, uh, it's, it's been uncomfortable to watch from the outside the kind of dialogue that some of the scientists have been having with each other about that because um they get a little aggressive yeah and you can understand <laughs> you, can, you can understand why because jealousy i don't know i th- <laughs> that's me saying not you that's I, me talking <laughs> it, the, i'm sure there's i'm sure there's some envy and jealousy involved um on the on the behalf of those who are not part of the original discovery sure but there's also, in any case, just leave you know the particular people of v- involved in Venus alone. In any case of making a claim of that magnitude, yeah, especially life, because life is pretty much one of the biggest discoveries of all time. Yeah. You can imagine scientifically, um, you can see, and I'm so conscious of this in myself when I get close to, as I said, even the much smaller goal of setting an exomoon, the ego creep in. And so as a scientist, we have to be so guarded against our own egos. You see the lights in your eyes of a Nobel Prize or yeah. um, the the fame and fortune and being remembered in the history books. And we all grew up in our training learning about Newton and Einstein, these giants of the field, Feynman, Maxwell. And you get the idea of these individual contributions which get immortalized for all time. And that's seductive. It's why many of us with the skill set to go into maybe banking instead decided, actually, there's something about the idea of being immortalized and contributing towards society in a permanent way that is more attractive than the financial reward of applying my skills elsewhere. So to some degree, that ego can be a benefit because it brings in skillful people into our field who might otherwise be tempted by money elsewhere. But on the other hand, it the closer you get towards when you start flirting with that Nobel Prize in your in your eyes, or you think you're on the on the verge of seeing something, you can lose objectivity. Uh, a very famous example of this is uh, Barnard Star. There was a planet claimed there by Peter van der Kamp. I think it was in 1968, 69, and at the time it would have been the first ever exoplanet ever claimed. And um, he he felt assured that this planet was there. He was actually using the wobbling star method, but using the positions of the stars to see them, to claim this exoplanet. It turned out that this planet was was not there. Subsequent analyses by both dynamicists and theorists and those looking at the instrumental data established fairly um, unanimously that there was no way this planet was really there. But Peter van der Kamp insisted it was there, despite overwhelming evidence that was accruing against him. Um, and even to the day he died, which was, I think, in, like nine, in the early 90s, he was still insisting this planet was there, even when we were starting to make the first genuine exoplanet discoveries. And even at that point, I think Hubble had even looked at that star and had totally ruled out any possibility of what he was talking about. And so that's a problem. How do you get to a point as a scientist where you just can't accept anything that comes otherwise? Because you're, it starts out with the the dream of fame and then it ends in a stubborn refusal to ever back down of course the flip side of that is sometimes you need that to have the strength to carry a belief against uh, the entire scientific community that resists your beliefs and so it's it's a double edged sword that it's can like, happen but i it i guess the di- the distinction here is evidence yes so in this right. case the, the evidence was so overwhelming. It wasn't really a matter of um, interpretation. It was. It was. You had collect. You would observe this star with the same, um, the same star, but with maybe ten, even a hundred times greater precision, mm-hmm. for prolonged, much longer periods of time. And there was just no doubt at this point. This planet was was a mirage, um, and so that's why you have to be very careful. I always say, don't ever name. You know, my my wife, my daughter, like name this planet after me that you discover. And I'm like, I can't, I can't ever name a planet after you. Because I'll be, I won't be objective anymore. How could I ever? How could I ever turn around to you and say that planet wasn't real that I named after you? So you, you're somebody that talks about and is, is clear in your eyes and in your way of being that you love the process of discovery, that joy, the magic of just, uh, you know, uh, 
seeing something, a new observation, a new idea, right? Um, but th I guess the point is when you have that great feeling is to then switch on the skepticism, <laughs> like to start like testing, um, what does this actually mean? Is, is this real? What are the possible mm -hmm. uh, different interpretations that could make this a lot less grand than I first imagined? And yeah. all, so both have the wander and the skepticism all in one brain. Uh, yeah, I think the generally the more I want something to be true, yeah. the more I oh. inherently doubt it. And I think that just comes from, you know, I, I grew up um, with a religious family and was just sort of indoctrinated to some degree, like many children are, that, okay, this is normal, that, you know, there's a God and this is the way the world is. Uh, God created the earth. And then as I became more, you know, well-read and illiterate of, of what was happening in the world scientifically, I started to doubt. And it really just struck me that the hardest thing to let go of when you when you do decide not to be religious anymore and it's not really a, a, like a light bulb moment, but it just kind of happens over my over sort of eleven to thirteen. I think for me it was happening, but it's that sadness of letting go of this beautiful dream which you had in your mind of eternal life for you know for for behaving yourself uh, on earth. You would have this beautiful heaven that you could go to and live forever, and that's very attractive. And for me personally, um, that was one of the things that pulled me against it was this it's it's like it's too good to be true and that it's very convenient that this could be um this could be so and i have no evidence directly in terms of a scientific sense to support this hypothesis and it just became uh really difficult to reconcile um my growth as a scientist and i know some people find that reconciliation mm. i i have not maybe i will one day um but as a general guiding principle, which I think I, I obtained from that experience, was that I have to be extremely guarded about what I want to be true because it's going to sway me to say things which, which are not true if I'm not careful. And that's, the, that's not what we're trained to do as scientists. So you felt from a religious perspective that there was um, a little bit of a gravitational field in terms of your opinions, like it was affecting how you could be as a scientist. Like as a as a scientific thinker, obviously you were young. Yeah, I th I think um, I I think that's that's true. That whenever you're, when whenever there's something you want to be true, it's it's the ultimate seduction intellectually. And I worry about this a lot with um, with you know, UFOs and with um, it's it's true already with things like Venus, phosphine, and uh, searching for astrobiological signals. We have to guard against this all the way through from however we're looking for life, however we're looking for whatever this big question is. There is a part of us, I think, I would love there to be life in the universe. Um, I hope there is life in the universe, but um, I'm somewhat uh, been on record several times as being fairly firm about trying to remain consciously agnostic about that question. I don't want to make up my mind about what the answer is before I've collected evidence to inform that decision. That's how science should work. If I already know what the answer is, then what am I doing? I'm, that's not a scientific experiment anymore. You've already decided, so what are you trying to learn? What's the point of, of doing the experiment if you already know what the answer is? There's no point. 